Hello, listeners. I'm Davy Greenwood, and you're listening to Expedition. Before we begin, I want to ask you a question. What is the furthest you've ever ridden on your bike? To the next town? Perhaps across your county or even country? What about halfway around the world? Zach Newham, aka the solo cyclist, did exactly that. In 2013, he got on his bicycle in England and kept pedaling until he made it to Sydney, Australia. In this episode of Expedition, Zach tells us all about it. Hi, Dave, can you hear me? Hey, good afternoon, Zach. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really well, thank you, dude. Whereabouts in the world are you calling in from? I am calling from Salisbury on quite an overcast day. Yeah, I'm about 50 kilometres to the east of you in Guildford. Oh, um, okay. Nice. Pretty similar here. Yeah. That's, that's my old neck of the woods, Guildford. Nice area. It really is. But we're here today to talk about places a lot further afield than Guildford and Salisbury. 2,500 or 25,000 miles, I should say, from the UK. Uh, that is your journey from the UK all the way to Australia on a bike back in 2013. 573 days, 27 countries, three continents. What was it that inspired you to embark on such an epic journey? I think initially it was just looking at maps and uh, I just saw it as, as a simple trip across a map um, in my head. Uh, of course, when you come to do the real thing, it's a lot more difficult than that. Um, but it, it really began when I was about 14, 15, talking with friends, uh, thinking up some sort of adventure that we could do. And at the time I was, I was at a boarding school uh, that was to us essentially a prison. Um, uh, um, and it was a, a termly boarding school. So um, on the weekends, you know, we'd be twiddling our thumbs, thinking for things to do. And, mm. and you know, this, I, I suppose, was, was the kind of life that, um, that really spurred me on to want to get out into the wider world and do some, some sort of big, big adventure. And so after seven years of primary school, seven years of secretary school, and then graduating from uni, I, I decided, you know what, it's time to do. It's time to get out there and, and just do something um mad and at that point i didn't have any friends who wanted to do something similar so it ended up being a, a solo trip um initially to vietnam um and i just wanted to uh, some sort of destination i could i could finish uh, at and uh, vietnam for me represented the end of the eurasian landmass so i was like right i'll finish there um and it was just as simple as that just point a map and think you know what that's that seems like a, a good enough destination for me and then you know halfway through I was enjoying it so much that I decided why not go a bit further um and yeah that's so really it was there was not much planning uh involved with with the with the trip itself why I did that particular trip or when you say not much planning when you've come to the decision you're going to do this trip to Vietnam onto Australia how do you start preparing for it, right? What made you choose a bike? How did you even find a bike that would get across the world? Is this something you've done before these long distance journeys? Uh, I had done one trip with friends, uh, the classic Land's End to John O'Groats in, in, in the UK, um, end nice. to end. Um, that was a 12 day stint. Again, not much planning, uh, just looking at a map and thinking what would be the, the quickest route from there to there. Um, and it happened to be a lot of A roads and B roads. So it was probably the least glamorous uh, cycle trip uh, you can imagine uh, on the hard shoulder of, of a lot of main roads with uh, four other 18 yeah. year olds. Um, but I enjoyed it. It was, it was great. It was, it, was the, it was something I hadn't experienced before where you, you don't know what you're going to see. You don't know who you're going to meet um, that day. Um, and for me, I think the bike made sense uh, because it was just the right speed. Um, I met a couple of French guys uh, who were walking a similar route uh, to the one I, I ended up doing um, 
they were walking from France to, to Australia. Wow. And they'd been on the, the road for five, five and a half years, I think it was. And for me, it was just, that's just too, too long. So I decided, no, not walking. Uh, walking's not for me. Um, and I had my childhood bicycle, Flash, um, is what I used to call it, because that's all you'd see when we cycled by. Um, <laughs> and I thought, you know what? that's probably good enough to get me through. And it was just a 200 pound bike I bought from Halfords, um, you know, cheapest chips. But um, I, I reckoned I could probably give it a shot on a bike, um, on my bike. And so, yeah, it ended up being a cycle ride. Did you have any trouble with the bike across the journey? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely there's, there's gonna be a few issues if you try and <laughs> do a big trip on a 200 pound bike. Um, I ended up actually the, before I even left the the I decided I needed touring tires to do the route I, I wanted to do um, and the frame itself wasn't uh, wide enough to allow the touring tires uh, to fit through so I decided to take a hammer and chisel to the frame um, to try and uh, <laughs> fit thicker tires um, through through yeah through the through the gaps um, and I probably chiseled a bit more than I should have. And there were two holes uh, either, either side of where the tire um, went through the frame. Um, so that was a bit of an issue along the way. I, I ended up going through some wet tarmac uh, in China and, and that increased the, the size of the holes that were gaping in the frame. So <laughs> it wasn't, uh, yeah, it wasn't the best bike. Uh, I mean, loads of punctures, loads of uh, pop spokes. Um, I had to rebuild my my wheel at uh, two or three occasions because uh, the spokes just kept popping and the wheel was just rotating um, mm. side to side uh, but yeah lots lots of mechanical issues again very little experience of, of fixing bikes um, and obviously hadn't done enough planning with the sort of stuff I needed to bring to to be able to fix those issues properly. You talk about following a map from above and the reality when you're at ground level is often quite different to that bird's eye view looking down. What was the most challenging terrain you came across during the journey? Yeah, I mean, that is definitely the case about looking at a map and planning a route for me to be and thinking, oh, it'll be fine. There won't be any obstacles in the way there. Um, but oh, yeah, the most, the most difficult terrain um, was definitely heavily rainforested areas, I'd say. Um, because they experience so much rainfall, the roads, I mean, the roads are very rarely tarmac, that the, they just turn to sludge um, and often rivers. Um, so, but having said that, I, I think I did actually search out those roads a little bit as well, um, because for me, what I wanted from this trip was that sense of adventure and to go pl places that other people tend not to go, because um, I think you tend to find... Um, you know, hidden gems when you when you go along those paths. So I think I did definitely made it harder for myself than it needed to be. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say, I mean, central Sumatra, uh, Laos as well, rural Laos was just awful. Some of the roads there. Um, I was often, my I said earlier, my bike could weigh up to 70 kilos. And it was often when I was going through these areas that it did. And I'd often have to carry it over a lot, a lot of uh, these obst obstacles, landslides and trees that have fallen down in the middle of the road. Um, so a lot of the time it, it ended up being a walk rather than a cycle um, or a carry. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the deserts were always quite challenging as well, um, especially when the sand had been uh, blown on, onto the road uh, because then you'd have to oh, slip and slide your way across. Um, right. How yeah, do you navigate those, somewhere like that? Yeah. Are you using maps or are you using a GPS? How are you getting? Uh, I did. I did have a um, a tablet actually that had a brilliant app, Maps.me, which is an offline map um, that you can you can use in these these areas. But I mean, the the issue with that is that you you kind of rely on your battery. Um, so I I had to um, sometimes rely on you know, the, the sun, where the sun was in the sky, that was always quite useful, I found, because um, mm. I was gen generally uh, cycling east or southeast. Um, so towards the end of the day, you'd be um, cycling, let me think about this, it was away from the sun. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, 
so that that was always handy I, sometimes i'd be cycling at night uh if i was chasing a visa um and then the stars would would often help as well if, if i'd lost battery um but often i mean if i was in more built up areas um actually less built up areas you'd often you'd just be following one road uh, so there's there's very little chance of taking a wrong turn um especially in somewhere like the outback i mean there was just one road for i think it was about three thousand kilometers it seemed in the video as well at times you were riding with other cyclists was that something that you came across throughout the route were there many others doing similar distances similar journeys to yourself where you could piggyback or, or ride with uh not many um i mean you would tend to to cross paths um at uh, border uh, stops um it tended to be um there was one uh there was well a couple of guys i met um at this um uh border crossing from kyrgyzstan to china because there was a, uh, a, I think it was a religious festival going on at the time. I think it was Ramadan, and um, as a result, the border was closed for four days. Um, and it's not a border people tend to go unless you're doing, you know, this type of trip. Um, so I was with them for four days, camps, camped at the the border, waiting for it to reopen. Uh, and as a result, we we then uh, met each other and and cycled for the next two weeks together, which was lovely. Um, have, have a bit of company for once um but yeah it, it was it tended to be when there's a bit of a bottleneck somewhere um you would meet these people and and share your show your trip but not often so were you camping the entire route yes yeah um that was the other pro to not having to plan too much ahead uh, is because i could stop off where wherever uh, i mean i'll say maybe once a month i would stay uh, at a hostel or um, couch surfing uh, with with um, locals or using warm showers, which is the cycle equivalent of couch surfing, um, and that's great because I mean, you know, the, one of the big cons of doing this sort of trip is is lon loneliness and spending all that time on the road in, in your own head. Um, so to be able to to share some time with uh, with locals um, in their own homes or in hostels um was fantastic but yeah i'll say 29 out of 30 days i was i was camping yeah warm shower is a beautiful feeling after 30 days on the road yeah yeah it's, but it's a great name so for the company but <laughs> that is what you look forward to my showers would often turn black after a week or so i bet <laughs> I was going to say, I bet you appreciate it a lot um, riding out of Germany. So at the start of the video, it's the snow on the ground and you're looking for a place to camp and you find, I think it's the, a roof or a small little area next yeah, to a Yeah, I think it's a woodshed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that it was November when I set off or late October. Uh, so when I reached... Um, Germany it, it began to snow quite heavily um, and I think that was the most I think it was the highest point in in the Black Forest where I got caught out um, in quite a heavy snowstorm and yes I there was just nowhere I could pitch my tent um, where I wouldn't just you know be snowed under so I found a little um, it was very it was something out of a, a fairy tale it was this idyllic um, sort of cabin in the middle of the woods uh, right, at the, right at the top of this hill with a little wo em empty woodshed uh, that I could uh, hunker down in um, so yeah it was quite a, quite a lovely moment but it looked amazing oh it was yeah it was great I mean the view in the morning Brilliant as well find. just e everything just covered in just meters of snow it was just yeah beautiful it did make it quite hard cycling the next day but um, <laughs> yeah, luck, luck, yeah the trucks had passed passed through in the morning so got away with it um, Did you struggle with the weather beyond snow at any other points on the journey? Uh, I mean, the weather in Australia got quite extreme. Um, I think the hottest my my uh, thermometer read was fifty one or fifty two degrees. Um, wow! Yeah, but at that point, I bought a uh, a rice paddy hat. What well, you know, one of those ones they wear in uh, Vietnam when they're when they're ploughing their fields yes. of rice. Um, yeah. And so, so I wore that uh, through the outback, which is fantastic, great sunshade. Um, and luckily I managed to keep most of the sun off me, but uh, the, the monsoons in, in Asia were 
were pretty bad. Um, but luckily, they they worked like clockwork. I mean, it would hit about four o'clock in the afternoon, and the heavens would just open, but um, and continue to to stay open until maybe seven or eight at night. Uh, so I'd always try and find shelter before before then. It was amazing. Every, every day, four o'clock, just really really heavy rain. Uh, but it meant I could cycle through the day. So um, yeah, I'd say. I mean, in terms of snow, I think. The worst it got was probably Germany uh, in the Alps as well. Um, there were a few passes that were shut, so I had to reroute. Um, and then just, yeah, the cold in China and uh, Tajikistan as well, up in the mountains was pretty extreme. Um, one one day I uh, I found a, uh, I think it was, it was some sort of storage house uh, in the middle of the Pamir Mountains um, that contained a load of sheep wool. Um, and again, this was during a during a snowstorm, so it was very lucky. I am um, great um, find. Yeah, this this hut, and I, I knocked on the door, and um, a, a Frenchman answered. I was like, "What? What is a Frenchman doing in the middle of the Pamir Mountains alone?" This is uh, this is Kyrgyzstan or, or Tajikistan. I can't remember which. Um, and he was another cyclist, and he he sought shelter in the in the place that night as well. And we were just huddled under these mountains of sheep wool uh, that they'd stored for the winter. So it was just perfect find right right when we needed it um and again just uh, one of those lucky lucky finds with uh, another fellow cyclist so we had lots of stories to share that night um so, mm, i thought you were going to say it was the walkers that you came across <laughs> yeah no i was going to say oh uh, no those nutters came later yeah <laughs> And what about the wildlife it seemed you were quite troubled by dogs as you were passing through villages I imagine you came across some other wildlife en route too. Uh, I had a bear outside my tent in Croatia, um, of all wow. places. Yeah, that was pretty scary. Um, my my pans uh, uh, got pretty dented that night um, from me clapping them like hell, trying to get the, the bear away from the tent. Um, but, so how did you know there was a bear out there? What, what well, I, I heard I heard these noises. Um, I was like, God, that doesn't sound good. Um, and it was kind of this deep breathing and heavy footsteps uh, outside the tent. I was like, God, I hope it's not some uh, angry Croatian man trying to get me off his land. Um, and I looked outside and there was, uh, yeah, a massive brown bear. So <laughs> immediately re my tent back up and uh, got my pads and banged them like crazy. Um, and that seemed to do the trick. He came back a couple of hours later, but I, I did the same thing and yeah, he went away again. So. That's a lesson not to store food in your tent. Um, yeah, and then I'd say the next worst were, in fact, probably worse than that, were, were the ants uh, in the rainforest in Laos, uh, army ants. Um, and they're quite clever little buggers because the, um, the big ones, the big army ants, um, have these massive mandibles that they can uh, pincer their way through the, your ground sheet in your tent and then all the little ones stream through the holes so i woke up about two o'clock in the morning absolutely covered head to toe in thousands of ants um and uh, I, I woke because one started biting me and, and i i'd read previously if one starts to bite the rest start to bite um oh, and that was definitely the case so i uh, quickly ran outside and luckily there was a river nearby and jumped into the river and then had to do the same with all my kit um, and then tried to find somewhere else to sleep that night. Uh, but yeah, the ants were pretty harrowing. Um, There's this great part at the end of the film where you've been warned about a river potentially infested with crocodiles and you go, I'm crossing it anyway. <laughs> well, you don't have a choice. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was faced with a, a horrible choice there i mean it was it was luckily it was it was dry season so the, the rivers were quite low um so you can and quite clear as well so you can see for quite a way uh either side of the crossing just to to make sure there aren't any crocs in the water when you go across um but you do have to do a couple of trips because i mean my bike was just so heavy that i'd take take the bike across first and go back for the panniers and um yeah that was quite scary because a couple of crossings before where there'd been bridges uh, I had seen crocodiles in the water so um, I just made sure I got got across as quick as possible um, and just kept my eyes peeled um, but yeah that was that was the, I think the river crossings were a bit nervy. Did you ever have any issues with injuries? I had 
a small accident in China. Uh, I was trying to outrun my visa. Uh, I didn't end up succeeding in the end. Uh, I was a day late, but I gave it a shot and rode through the night. And uh, it was raining quite heavily that night. Um, but I was just so close to the border that I was just just get one last shot and just pushed through. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just a very, very unlucky moment. There was a car coming or a truck coming the other way with headlights on full beam. And uh, just at the point where it, um, it blinded me, uh, there was a rock right in my path and just went um, head over handlebars and um, luckily landed uh, well, in the path the truck had just taken. Uh, so if it was, you know, a second or two earlier, you know, it could have ended a very different wow. way. But luckily I just had a very sore knee and a few broken spokes. Um, so nothing too hard to fix there. But, um, yeah, I think that was part, part of the reason why I was a bit late going across the border in China. I was just kind of limping across. But, um, yeah, I got away with that. I mean, the worst I'd say I, I had was... Uh, getting giardia in turkey i ate some roadside apricots that people were, were flogging and i hear that's the worst thing you can do um dried fruits uh, and ended up being horrendously sick for a few few days and then it resurfaced in china um but oh. yeah it was nothing nothing too too debilitating um i was quite lucky so you mentioned about logistics there crossing countries with visa requirements and two months in China, which just thinking about China on a map is an endeavor in itself to cross uh, from west to east. How does that work in that you've told me you didn't plan a trip? So I'm guessing you didn't plan any of these visas in advance. Was it just a case of rocking up to the border and saying, hey, here's my passport, can I cross? Yeah, I mean, land border crossings are always quite interesting places to to, to be. Um, you would tend to go to the embassy uh, of the capital city of the country preceding the one you're about to, to enter. Um, so that would often mean a, a three or four day stay uh, in, in the capital waiting for your visa to process, which was always quite enjoyable because I'd always be staying with uh, usually couch surfing hosts or warm showers hosts at that point. Um, so it was always an excuse to stop, recuperate, explore uh, whilst your visa was was processing. But um, yeah, it wouldn't always go as smoothly as planned. Um, I mean, the Chinese one was quite interesting. Um, you're not technically supposed to enter West China um, overland. You're supposed to fly over the border into East China, um, and then you're allowed to to explore the western side. Um, but they, uh, for them, I think the way around it is is to try and get as much money out of t- tourists coming through um, or, or travellers coming through. Um, to, yeah, to, it, it just works like a bribe system basically. So you just have to have to pay your way across, and they'll turn turn a blind eye. Um, and the same. You did it in the back of a lottery, lottery right? Because there was a part where you're in, I said you did it in the back of a lorry, right? In that there's a part of the (laughs) video where you're in a lorry. Yeah, so we we thought so that was a that was a when I met the two other cyclists at the border crossing. So we we thought we were going to get smuggled across into west western China, uh, and um, found a lorry driver who was yeah willing to do it. Um, And then it turned out that's that wasn't the case and he was just driving us across the no man's land in between Kyrgyzstan <laughs> and China and then he would drop us off at the authorities in China for them to deal with us um so yeah it didn't, didn't quite end the way we had planned um hence the, the bribe we then had to pay um but yeah uh it's like they can be fun places to be border crossings and the journey itself I mean it is epic it looks amazing but you've mentioned as well the other side of these great adventures especially when you do it alone the loneliness how do you deal with that day after day after day potentially of seeing no other person but knowing you've got to continue yeah i i'd say the first 15 minutes of the trip was the worst and hardest 15 minutes of the the whole adventure just because it, it it's the sinking in feeling of oh god am I really doing am I going to be alone for this long 
I've got no idea how long it's going to be, but it's going to be pretty lonely. And then I think you just adjust. Um, you realise that the connections you make along the way are going to be fleeting. Um, so you try and make the most of them. Um, and you do get a sense of camaraderie with the people you meet. And um, usually the people who open their doors to you, the people who, um, who are just the most wonderful kind people you you know you meet along the way they're, they're so generous and I think just those few times you do meet those generous people I think it, it um, really helps uh, with loneliness but um, yeah I'd say the the deserts and the outback um, were were tricky I mean I, I, I'd go for you know at least I think three or four days uh, in each desert with, without seeing another person sometimes. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, just you make the most of the, the times you do have with people. And then uh, I think you just learn to cope with, with being in your own head for the rest. Yeah. Right. And I believe uh, you had a T-shirt during the trip, or at least at the end with the solo cyclist written across it. But what really comes across in the journey is just how many people you meet and even though um, for, for a large part of the video it is just shots of you riding there's also an equal number of um, shots where you're, you're meeting people or interacting with people who is it you remember after eight years of eight years preceding this journey you remember the most from the trip Ah, oh, I mean, all of my hosts uh, who, you know, he brought me in to, to stay the night and have a warm shower. I think that they, I'll, I'll remember all of them um, for the rest of my life. But the, I mean, there are a couple of characters that just stick out, especially the ones you don't, uh, you haven't planned to meet. So sometimes you, you'll just bump into people along the way and they'll, they'll just want to host you um, randomly. And there was a one guy in, uh, in i think it was in sumatra uh, he was riding along on a motorbike um and pulled up alongside me and said come stop 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 come come with me come with me stop stop and um so he got me to to pull over and um then he, he ended up hosting me for a couple of days but in that time he he asked me if i would come and um host his football match and uh, he ended up taking me along to this uh, local football match in his village um, with a couple of thousand people watching. I think two um, two villages had come to compete for this annual uh, trophy. Um, and I was the I was made the the um, honoured guest there. And I, I'd have to uh, I congratulated the players at the end of the match uh, one by one, going along the road with them all lined up, shaking their hands and. Um, giving small pleasantries to each one and then I'd have to do a speech at the end and it was all this just being made to feel like they're that special in this strange environment was just surreal and um you were the guy um, who handed them the trophy so, so again, I said you were the guy that handed yes, them the yeah, trophy yeah well that's it yeah I they wow. gave me, me the yeah, I, I they they made me feel like I was the queen or something. I'd have to do this yeah speech and then I handed the trophy to the winning team and um yeah, passed down the line. It was yeah, just so surreal. Um, so yeah, th I think those moments that you, you don't plan for, I think, uh, are moments that I'm, I will remember most. And there was yeah, just quite quite a few of them along the way. Um, One of the things I did want to ask you about once you've completed the journey, so you get to Australia and you get on a plane, and I thought, right, he's flying home. This must be such an exciting journey to come home after all that time um, even just to sit on a plane like I look at that journey to Australia 22 hours 20 hours on a plane as hellish that must have been a dream for you being able to sit down for that amount of time and not have to move your legs but then you get to the airport and you say right I'm in France and I think why has he flown back to France why has he flown back to England what happened there? Why did you decide to to fly to France and then ride back home, uh, take the ferry across the channel and then ride along the coast? Um, I think I was quite scared of of the end being an anticlimactic. Um, 
so I wanted to do this this home leg. You know, I've been building up the, the finish in my head for for a year and a half, um, and I wanted it to be to be special. Of course, it's never going to quite live up to, to your expectations. Um, maybe not in the ways you expect, anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted just this this kind of week long kind of finish where I, I could allow it to to sink in rather than uh, arriving home and you know spontaneously having to adjust to. To the fact that you've just finished this this long uh, adventure, um, I think looking back, that was the that was the right decision. I because I I had time to to revisit all the places I'd I cycled through on the first week of my trip in the last, um, and that was really nostalgic. Um, and then yeah, just just the to have the time to to face the end, the the, the end of this this adventure mm. you've been on for for that long. Um, was was probably the right decision as well. Was it always your intention to put the footage you recorded on the journey together as a film? Uh, it, it was something I I'd been toying with for sure. Uh, I mean, it actually took me three, maybe four years after I came back from the cycle trip to actually put it together. I think I'd just been putting it off. Um, and I've never, you know, I don't have a background in in making films at all. It was it was just. Um, off the cuff really um and actually looking back i i think i would have done it in a totally different way but um yeah i, th I think in the back of my mind i think because i'd done this trip alone i felt like i needed some way to share it with people um just so they could have a, an insight into you know what what it might have been like um and for me it really was a lot of it was the road it was a it, it was a cycling trip and, and a lot of it the vast majority of it was spent on the road cycling so i wanted a, a video to i wanted the video to portray that um yeah i th i think um i think that's that's the main reason i wanted to do it really was just to share it with others um because i mean a solo trip is you know how else are you going to be able to to share it um and, well maybe writing as well but yeah for mm. me i think it was just a, a, the easier of the two either writing a book or making a film i thought that making a film would be would be easier and i noticed on youtube in those kind of evenings where you're watching youtube videos and it recommends another one to you that there have been some other filmed cycling adventures since or potentially before there was one in uh, scotland in the outer hebrides right that's right so yeah. was that before or after this trip? No, that that was after. I think um, I, I think after doing something of this, of, well, of that scale, I, I wanted to do you know smaller trips. I didn't want to do something big, um, at least not straight away. And I, I also I spent so much time abroad that I wanted to do more at home. And for me, Scotland has always had a pull. Um, so yeah, I decided to do uh, shorter trips up in Scotland. And there's been a few since since getting back. Um, one of them was a cycle ride um and yeah again another solo one so i thought well i need to film it because how are my f friends and family going to be able to know what it was like um but yeah that was just a short week-long trip and you know thank god it wasn't longer um <laughs> i think i need to have a break before doing anything of that length again um but yeah, it's, it's great i love just getting outdoors and and you know in, in between jobs doing um doing little trips and um that was one of them and are there any potential adventures planned or at least you've been thinking about on the horizon for 2021 if you can get out and do them? Uh, 2021? Well, we'll see what happens for 2021. Who knows? Um, I mean, I my girlfriend is very keen to do to experience something of what I experienced on the road. Um, so we've been toying with the idea of doing a tandem ride um, in Australia. Nice. Um, wow. Not sure if we'll be able to do that in 2021. Um, but yeah, that's definitely on the cards. Um, and 2021, well, possibly more short trips up in Scotland. You know, there's so much great scenery and, and um, great rides you can do in this country. I don't think you need to go too far abroad to have an adventure. Um, so yeah, probably mm. more trips, more trips here. What advice would you give to someone listening to this now who's got a bike singing in the garage um, and is thinking, hey, I want to take it out for a, a bit of a longer journey, a day, a week, a month. What would it, what would you say 
based on all the experiences of long distance cycling to someone who said what what would be the one bit of advice you'd give to me don't fret too much about planning you, you don't you, i mean i i did very little exercise very little planning i was very out of shape when i set off on my my cycle rides and you just get fit along the way and you work it out as you go um i mean that's part of the fun i mean that is for me that's almost what sums up an adventure really is is um you know not having everything planned to within an inch of its life and just you know having making those little mistakes and having a bit of hardship along the way is, is all part and parcel of the, the experience um and yeah i think um just do it um, i think do it and uh, enjoy it meet people and go to wonderful places and um, get to know how beautiful this planet is along the way amazing Zach, truly, thank you very much for giving up your time and hopefully see another video soon of a, a tandem across Australia. Well, oh, fingers crossed. No, thank you very much for having me, David. Thank you very, very much indeed. It's been a pleasure. Sure. After I finish this recording, I'm getting my bike out of the garage and going for a ride. You can view Zach's film, The Road to Sydney, about his journey on YouTube now. I'm positive that after watching it, you'll be itching to get out on your own bike. Now back in the UK, Zach's working on a number of creative projects. You can view them all on his website, natural-art.uk, where he assures me future movies he makes will be posted too. I'll include the link to the website in a description of the podcast. And sadly, that concludes season one of Expedition. Thanks to everyone for joining me on this do-it-yourself podcast journey. If you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to Expedition on your podcast app and be the first to hear announcements about season two. Speak to you all again soon.